Thank you to the course directors for asking me to come speak today. So for the next 20 minutes, um, talk to you about hepatitis B, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time at all about natural history or uh, course of disease because the talk really is about what's happening in the future. So we're gonna start talking uh, strictly about therapy and what to expect in the future. So our hepatitis B therapies now um, are different from hepatitis C in that we can't cure hepatitis B yet. So our current aims for a patient with hepatitis B is to suppress viral replication. And there are a lot of studies that show if you do that, you can hopefully prevent cirrhosis liver failure and then hopefully also prevent liver cancer. So the big question that always comes up with everybody is who needs hepatitis B treatment? Um, and in the old paradigm, we used to have to divide the patients initially into three buckets. You had to decide whether your patient was an E antigen negative patient, an E antigen positive patient, or had cirrhosis. And then the only two labs you really needed to monitor to decide how to treat was hepatitis B viral DNA levels or the serum ALT. Most of that still holds, um, most of that is still true now. So these are the current drugs that are FDA approved for hepatitis B. So you can see that there are six oral drugs, they're on top, and then there are two interferon drugs on the bottom. We don't much use the interferons anymore because the side effect profile is very toxic and the efficacy of interferons are still not that good. So we have the oral drugs on top and you can see that the most recent drug was tenofovir alafenamide, which was FDA approved uh, last year. So this is um, a table of uh, the published guidelines for treating hepatitis B. And it may be a little bit difficult to see, um, but the European guidelines, the Asian guidelines, the American guidelines, and the US algorithm have stated their criteria for starting treatment. And you can see that, again, you have to decide if your patient is E antigen positive, E antigen negative, you have to check the HPV DNA, the ALT level, and then you have to decide whether or not they have cirrhosis. So that's a lot, and you can see that there is some agreement among the societies as far as viral load cutoffs and things. Um, still some differences. They're all starting to coalesce towards the same indication. Well, to make this a lot easier for you, because it's difficult to remember everything, um, we recently, Dr. Tong, uh, one of our colleagues at UCLA, recently published the Asian American treatment algorithm, and I think it's appropriate because at least 80% of all hepatitis B patients are Asians. So the Asian American treatment algorithm is something we came up with. And you really don't need to distinguish E antigen positive or E antigen negative anymore. Basically, you just have to look at your hepatitis B patient as a hepatitis B patient. So this is our algorithm, and just to kind of make it easier for you, again, DNA levels and ALTs are what you use to determine who needs treatment. Now, if your patient has a low viral DNA, I'm gonna give that a red indication. I always used to use the, the analogy of a red stoplight. So if the viral load is low, that's red. If the ALT is normal, that's red. So the general guidelines say, and we also agree, that if you have two reds, um, that's a patient that does not need treatment. That's called an inactive carrier, and you can just evaluate that patient every three to six months. Dr. Tong likes to see them every three months. I see my patients every six months. But that's a double red patient, inactive. If your patient has a viral load above 2,000, and now 2,000 is kind of the generally accepted cutoff for hepatitis B DNA level. So 2,000 IUs per ml, that's a green light. And if their ALT is elevated, that's another green light. So if your patient has two green lights, that's a patient that should be treated. 
So that's the easy distinction to tell you who needs treatment and who needs uh, to be watched, an inactive carrier versus an active hepatitis B patient. Now, there's always cases that you'll see where a patient comes in with an elevated viral load, which is a green light, yet their ALT is 10 or 9, completely normal. Those were typically what we call the immune tolerant patients, and they're still a controversial group. Uh, a lot of the societal guidelines say we should biopsy these patients as a tiebreaker, but if you try to convince a 30-year-old immunotolerant patient to get a liver biopsy, they'll essentially walk out of the clinic. So liver biopsies were not practical. So Dr. Tong came up with what we call a risk score, and uh, so the, the criteria are listed there, but as you can see, most of these criteria are non-invasive lab tests that you can get um, and if the patient has any one of those criteria, that's a patient that should probably be treated. But if the patient has none of those criteria, it's a patient that can be watched. So that helps you decide what to do with the immune tolerance. What if your patient has a, a low viral load, yet their ALT is elevated? That's a patient that probably has elevated ALT for some other reason other than hepatitis B. And so our algorithm says you have to look for that other cause. And the most common cause these days is, of course, fatty liver. So that's the Asian American treatment algorithm in a nutshell. So it makes it pretty easy. And if there's anything that, you know, to help you decide who needs treatment for hepatitis B or not, um, this car, if you make a small pocket card out of this algorithm, you'll make it very straightforward, I think. So now you have your double green light patient. You decided to start on treatment. In the old paradigm, if your patient was an e-antigen positive, wild type hepatitis B patient, you started them on antiviral therapy. The first thing that happens is their viral load goes to undetectable a little bit longer and eventually ALT normalizes. So what have you done? You've taken a two green light patient, you've now made them a two red light patient. You made them inactive, you suppress their virus. You keep treating those patients under the old paradigm until their E antigen becomes negative and hopefully they develop E antibody and that's called E antigen seroconversion. And that's variable. So if a patient says, how long, if an e-antigen positive patient says, how long do I have to be on treatment, doctor? You say, well, as long as it takes for you to develop e-antigen seroconversion. And that could take anywhere from one to 20 years. It's variable. But the nice thing about that is once an e-antigen positive patient develops e-antigen seroconversion, the general uh, recommendation is to continue them for an additional 6 to 12 months on therapy. This is called consolidation. And then you can stop drug. And if you follow these kind of guidelines, um, up to 90% of the patients would have what we call a durable response. So that's the advantage of having an e-antigen positive patient, is that you potentially have an endpoint for treatment, and that's e-antigen seroconversion. If your patient is an E antigen negative patient and they're two green lights, you start them on antiviral therapy. So the viral load goes to zero, the ALT goes to normal. So you've now made a two green light patient, a two red light patient again. The problem with E antigen patients is they need indefinite therapy because it's been well shown that if you stop virus, if you stop antiviral therapy in an e-antigen negative patient, the relapse rate is very high. So now the recommendation is you continue indefinitely, lifelong, or unless they happen to lose surface antigen, which is still a very rare occurrence. But if they lose surface antigen, which I'll talk about in a little bit, that's probably the closest that we're going to get to a cure of hepatitis B. So if you're lucky enough to have a patient lose surface antigen, then you can stop. But for the most part, the vast majority of patients on hepatitis B therapy will need lifelong treatment. Now, if you recall, I said that the E antigen positives, you know, you can potentially stop treatment when the E antigen seroconvert. That thinking is starting to change now, too. 
because with longer follow-up of those patients, we're finding that five to 10 years later, even those patients are starting to relapse. And then they relapse as E antigen negative. So then you have to put them back on therapy indefinitely. So now the new thinking for hepatitis B is regardless of whether they're E antigen positive or E antigen negative, if you start them on therapy, it's probably gonna be lifelong therapy or unless they lose surface antigen. So that brings the big Achilles heel of our current treatments because if you're gonna be treating a Hep B patient now lifelong, then resistance is a big problem because now you're putting a 30 or a 40 year old patient on drug and they're gonna be on drug for 30, 40, 50 years and you cannot have resistance. So if you look at the current oral medications we have, a lot of the older drugs like lamivudine, um, adefavir, telbividine are very poor as far as resistance, whereas the newer drugs, tenofovir and entecovir, are very good. So the guidelines, the societal guidelines now say, if you have a patient who you are gonna start on antiviral therapy. So if you have a hepatitis B patient who meets your two green light criteria and you're gonna start them on treatment, the preferred drugs are the, the drugs with low resistance. So tenofovir or entecovir. So antiviral resistance is bad. Uh, there is cross resistance between classes. And under Dr. Tong's recommended therapies, if you develop any resistance to any of the older drugs, the recommended therapy, if you look all the way to the right in the column, is switching to a low uh, resistance drug. And for the most part now, that's tenofovir, because tenofovir still has 0% resistance. Um, so. Uh, in a nutshell, you can avoid most of these problems by just starting your patient on the preferred drugs in the first place, either tenofovir or entecovir. Okay, so that's where we are now. We have these drugs we can treat with, but what's the problem with long-term oral antiviral therapy? It costs a lot. For 30 to 40, sometimes 50 years of drug, that's a lot of money. The functional cure rate or surface antigen loss rate is very low. We can't, at this point, cure hepatitis B, but we can suppress it. There's always the risk of rebound if the patient stops drug, if they run out of insurance and they lose drug, the risk of flare and consequent liver failure. And then there's direct toxicities, you know, the potential for kidney issues. Um, for bone issues and some muta, mutagenic uh, potential with some of these drugs. So it's not a perfect answer to, pay to, to place a patient on antiviral therapy for 30 to 40 years. What we would like, um, like hepatitis C, is to be able to cure hepatitis B. If we could cure hepatitis B, we can stop treatment. What we would like in the future is some sort of finite therapy. And after that, you can stop therapy and all evidence of the virus is gone. So we would like for hepatitis B what we have with hepatitis C. So what is, what is the landscape for hepatitis B now? There is a tremendous amount of research that's going on and starting for hepatitis B. Because if you look at the hepatitis B viral life cycle, there are numerous places where we can potentially intervene with drug. You, you can block entry, you can block nuclear transport, you can block transcription, translation, encapsidation, secretion, assembly. It's a very complicated virus and, it's, and the virus has a very intimate relationship with the host immune system. So there's a lot of research going on looking at how we can cure a patient of this virus. There are virologic approaches, designing drugs that block the viral uh, proteins for replication. And then there are drugs that enhance the host immune system to clear out the virus. 
So these are all strategies that are currently being looked at for hepatitis B cure. And this is a small slide, and I apologize. Um, these are all the potential HPV therapies that are currently in the pipeline. You can see there are a number of them. There are a number of different classes of antivirals, direct acting antivirals. There are a number of drugs that are immune modulators. But if you look all the way to the right, the far column, they're all either preclinical or phase one, maybe one or two entering phase two. So nothing is ready for prime time yet for hepatitis B. But there's a tremendous amount of research that's going on now. Um, for most of the pharmaceutical companies, hepatitis C research is pretty much ended. We're done with hepatitis C. All the scientists now have been shifted over to hepatitis B. So what are we aiming for? The inactive state, well, we're already there. We can already do this. We can already take a patient, put them on drug, suppress the virus. Um, the only problem is they will always remain S and hepatitis B surface antigen positive. So we can suppress the virus. We can't get rid of the virus. What we would like is a functional cure. That's a patient that we can hopefully get rid of the hepatitis B surface antigen. So that's difficult now, a very rare occurrence. We've seen a few. I've seen about 5% of my patients lose surface antigen on treatment, but it's rare. Will we ever achieve a complete cure, a patient completely rid of every DNA particle of hepatitis B virus? That might be a little bit ambitious, but for the most part, most people think that a functional cure is clinically as good as a, as a complete cure. So what are all our medications for the future aimed at? Surface antigen loss. That is our goal. If we can do that, then we feel that hepatic decompensation, liver cancer will go down, survival will go up. This is what we call a functional cure and hopefully this is something in the next maybe three to five years, um, I'll be able to talk to you about drugs that can do this. So what might a curative regimen look like in the future? Well, if we take lessons from hepatitis C, hepatitis B may be the same. Hopefully what we'll have is a one pill kind of fixed dose combination pill, something with a potent nucleoside analog like, you know, tenofovir or entecovir, mixed with a, a CCC DNA inhibitor, you know, maybe mixed with an immune modulator, maybe mixed with an E antigen um, blocker. So it would be nice if we have a fixed dose pill for hepatitis B that I could tell you you could take for three months or six months your surface antigen goes away, you're now cured of hepatitis B, and uh, you can stop medication and life goes on. So in conclusion, um, hepatitis B is still a big problem. Um, we haven't been able to cure it. It causes a lot of issues, cirrhosis and liver cancer. You now know, at least now, which patients need treatment. It's those patients with two green lights, an elevated viral load and elevated ALT. And we're constantly redefining our definition of what a successful treatment endpoint is. For now, it's making a two green light patient a two red light patient. Undetectable virus, normal ALT. In the future, hopefully we can cure them by getting rid of surface antigen. Thank you very much.